Thursday Night Tailgate, where the spotlight is always on the positive. Tune in Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time to hear your favorite NFL legends, players, and coaches sharing their stories. Now back to Chris and Bob. I wouldn't joke about anything else that happened tonight. And now back in making a record 20th appearance with us on Thursday Night Tailgate is our good friend and former Rams Pro Bowl quarterback and TNT Hall of Famer. Jim Everett. Jimmy, how are you doing tonight, my friend? Hi, Jim. Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Bob. Hey, how how ironic is that? You have on you you have on um your last guest, uh, Robin, Robin Cole, Cole. Right? Yep. Yeah. I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I was there. My dad was a professor at the University of New Mexico, and we used to go watch his play. And wow. then he goes on to the Pittsburgh Steelers. So yeah, he was a stud. I tell you, that guy. I mean. Why he, you know, how he picked New Mexico of all the schools, but he was by far the best athlete on the field. Um, all the games I watched, watching, watching his career, I could see why the Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, one of them, because man, it was just dumb. And it was, you know, here you have Robin Cole on, and I'm going, oh my god, I know him. I, I saw him play. He was my, he was my guy growing up. <laughs> For the Lobos, you know, it was great. Here you go. That's fantastic. Great. Indeed. It's a small world, yeah. But thanks for having me on, guys. Jimmy, I want to start our time with you today, obviously getting your thoughts on your Rams. Now that uh, Aaron Donald is uh, signed, sealed, and delivered, um, your thoughts on the, on the Rams. Is anything short of a Super Bowl appearance going to be a disappointment for them this year? Uh, you know, I was, it, they, they're stacked. I'm telling you, it, 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 they're, they're getting all the uh, – I've never seen an 11-5 team recool. And get the guys that they got, and you know, spend the money they got, and still under the salary cap quite a bit. I, they've, they've got a stacked team, and I always look at it like this: and keep it in ready, and then hopefully the, the team, you know, understands it. Is that the Indianapolis 500? You can sit on the pole and have to car. You got to go, you know, all those laps and still win. So there's a whole bunch of laps to be played. Or, you know, the last to go in this season and it starts this Monday night against the Raiders. And, uh, and I, I would, I would think they have to be favored. They have to be some sort of upset, you know, or, you know, injuries or, you know, as in the Indianapolis 500, you have to blow an engine not, not to get that. But I say they, they're, uh, they're loaded. But again, other teams are going to be growing through the years. The rookies are going to contribute. I mean, who knew, uh, New Orleans with Camara last year and, and Kansas City with their young running back, you know, there's teams that are going to grow, and uh, that's going to be household names. And who knows? There's maybe someone steps up the Raiders and takes up Mac's position and does extremely well, or maybe Mac goes up to the Bears and wrecks Aaron Rodgers quite a bit. So I mean, a lot of things can happen. But I really like the, the chances of the, of the Rams, and I, I think yeah, Vegas does too. So give us your assessment of the Rams' offense. I know Todd Gurley was your number one pick in our fantasy football draft, so I know you're high on him and for good reason. But uh, give us your assessment of their offense. Well, it all starts with McDag. I mean, as the coordinator, I know I know we lost Olson, quarterback coach, and uh, we lost the, the offensive, the title offensive coordinator um, as well. But we got two young guys in. I think it all starts with McDag. Goes through the system. I think we got the right guys as far as. Brandon Cooks on the outside. You got Woods coming back. You got Cooper Cup catches everything, and I think that chemistry is going. I think the big question mark in the offense is they got the right the right guard that has to come in because of the position with Brown. Um, so we got to make sure the offensive line is cohesive. And the other part is when are the tight ends going to be involved? Because McVay is, you know, from that old Washington system, they always had tight ends that could make plays, and the, they were the guys. But so far, Hickey and, and uh, other who are in there right now haven't really been seeing the look. Um, but, you know, they've been they've been doing it with girls, and that's how they pick up their, their, their yards. And i tell you what, it's something pretty, pretty spectacular to see the innovation that McVay does and be able to distribute the ball to all five of the wide receivers, or five of the ball catchers, not only wide receivers, but tailback, tight end, the different personnel groups, the matchups. Um, I, I, I can't wait to see it. We haven't seen golf in any of the preseason. So, you know, hopefully he's not too rusty, but I have a feeling we're going to see week one more of the offense being a little bit more rusty than, than we will maybe week six, seven, eight when they're 
when they're in full tune. And Jim, as you can imagine, I'm pretty concerned right now with the situation with Le'Veon Bell. You went through a holdout situation, sort of under different circumstances, but you understand the business side. You got sort of smacked in the face with the business side as soon as you, you know, were in the draft. But you, your thoughts on Le'Veon Bell and if he's doing the right thing or the wrong thing? Well, I don't think anyone can judge except the man himself. And Le'Veon, you know, he's got, put it this way. I think if this franchise tag is 14.5, number 14.5 million, which sounds like right. a certain number, a number for anybody to get paid. But, but let's not, let's not even go there. I know Todd Gurley signed a, you know, I think another four year extension. So they got another six years for an average of 15 million a year. So I'm looking at this thing and I know that Gurley, I think one and Bobby on Bell went two. I, I would think that minimum offer would be what Todd Gurley made. For running back, but I think what the, what what Lavion Bell's trying to say is that his skill set is more in line to to what top receivers make. So would uh, would a Sammy Watkins who's making sixteen million? Would you trade Sammy Watkins for Lavion Bell straight up? I mean, you yeah. probably would. And oh, well, I mean, but when you're talking about <laughs> impact for a team, why wouldn't? Why wouldn't Lavion Bell be worth sixteen million? Uh, Brandon Cook versus Lavion Bell. Uh, I mean, you, you look at that, and it makes sense. But the position right now, you know, is you know fourteen and a half, fifteen million. And I think Lavion Bell saying, "Why can't I make sixty? And I don't, I don't, I think he has a good argument. I think if you look back a few years back, Jimmy Graham kind of made that argument as well because tight ends were only getting paid so much. But he's like, "Listen, I'm an outside slot receiver." I should be making what receivers make. Yeah, he, he, you know, he, he never really got that through, but I think that's the type of impact that we're talking about. You know, impact player, one position that, that doesn't get paid like the other positions. And I think that's what Lavin and Bell's doing. Is it right or wrong? Is it his intent, Chris, Bob? I, mean, I don't even think his teammates have a really, you know, I've heard his teammates as often as linemen coming out saying, oh, he should do this, or he let us down, or he did this or that. Well, this is, this is his financial career. When the guy's retired, when he's Robert Cole's age, my age, his teammates aren't going to be judging him. But his bank account might. <laughs> so, you know, it's just his call. And if he thinks that coming in Saturday morning so he can collect the check and, and save his body for one game makes a difference, then, well, that's his decision. Is he going to pay penalties or this and that? Yeah, I think overall, when we look at the whole big picture, I, I think the franchise tag is broken. I think that whole with the collective bargain agreement is an absolute cop out for the owner. Because if you got a, a player like, let's say, for example, Aaron Donald, Aaron Donald's number one guy at the position, or, or arguably, arguably, but yet the franchise tag, you pay him the average of the top five. Doesn't mean the top, you know, the top five players. Well, that's if you're the number one guy, that's a bargain price for the team. And then even the next year, because Aaron Donald and he's a tackle the position pay, they don't pay that position as much. Even when they pay twenty five percent more over the franchise tax, that's still a bargain. I'm glad they came to a conclusion that I think Aaron pays well, doing as well as the right guy to pay. But I'm saying the franchise tax system is broken. And hopefully in our next collective bargaining agreement we can do away with it. Bob, question for Jim. Hey, Jim, I was telling Chris earlier in the show that you threw for 35,000 yards in your career, which comes out, I did the math, Jim, about 20 miles. What seems like a bigger accomplishment, 35,000 yards or 20 miles? <laughs> oh, a lot on your arm, God. no matter how you look at it. I don't know. I mean, I know that if I was thrown for 20 miles, that doesn't, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't include every, you know, every couple steps getting hit. It's almost like, okay, let's go, let's go for a marathon, but every, every time you take about five or six, seven strides, you get, you get hammered. <laughs> I don't think through, right? <laughs> so you know, there's there's a couple of completions either, right? <laughs> no, well, it's just, yeah, you know, all those ones that you, you, you threw, but did you know, threw away or threw to the other team, which God, well, Lord knows I, I did a bunch of those. Thank God there's Brett Barber League that, that's the record. I, I'll tell you this story. I was over at Purdue, and uh, <laughs> there's this Dale Samuels who worked there. 
And he would come out to me and go, hey, don't break my record. And that's why I was playing for Purdue. <laughs> I look at him, I just start laughing. I mean, this is before game. He had the, he had the Purdue record of six interceptions during the game. Mm-hmm. And he, he always was another quarterback who beat his record. <laughs> that's not a good pregame speech, is it? That's <laughs> beautiful. It is. Uh, Lord knows I tried, but, you know, I think the point was most of I got pretty much most of that, you know, in the time. But anyways, it does happen when you, when you take risks and you try to, you know, project what's going on downfield. You're going you're gonna to throw the ball the other guy. But I don't know. The, the 20, 20 miles is pretty dang far. 35 miles yeah. is pretty far, but i tell you that what they're doing today, I was just looking at Maddie on TV um, tonight with Atlanta. He's thrown for 41, um, 41,000 yards. But I know mean, those guys aren't taking the hits like they used to. I mean, our head was open game. Uh, you know, as long as they were within a step of you, they could light you up. So, I mean, the rule changes are so much better for these guys to be able to play a little bit later in their life. I mean, I knew when I was 35 and I retired, I mean, I was pretty broke up. These guys now are getting into their 40s, and I, I'm just amazed that, you know, they're not taking the knee shots, the head shots, all the different trauma shots, which is really good for the game. Maybe not good for the game. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you, Jim, about this situation in New York this week with the kid Davis Webb, who was supposed to be Eli Manning's backup. Uh, the kid from California seems to be a, Highly touted guy when they got him a couple years ago. They gave him a four-year deal, et cetera. And then uh, kind of surprisingly, they let him go, Jim. And from what I'm gathering, from what some coaches said and some, from what analysts, analysts say around here, it was kind of because of his decision-making, the fact that he probably couldn't throw the short pass quick enough and, uh, and, and be as accurate as they thought. I mean, is this a lot different than it was 30 years ago because of the shorter passing game? Why do you think he uh, he just kind of lost favor, Jim? Well, okay, let's let's put it a little bit more generic, and it's kind of counter to Jared Goff, and that's because they both came out of the same system. Mm-hmm. Webb was after him, and actually, I think he played a year or whatever, and, and put some kicks back up. But that offensive system, the Red, Red Raider offensive system, is totally different than what we're running the pros. And that's what Carson Wentz went through up when he was playing in the South Dakota place. They, they were running a pro offense. And so they, the pros could look at Carson and go, you get it. You know what you got to read. You, you know where to turn the line. You know. But in the Red Raider offense, you don't. And that was one of the big gambles on Jared Goff because those guys coming from that type of system have to make a huge learning curve, which I was with Jared when he was doing it. And it was deer in the headlights. Look, but he's, he's pretty savvy. Real savvy, and he's he's getting it. And thank God he's got a guy like Jay up in his head to be able to do that stuff. But I don't think Webb was. When you look at, I think maybe when you look at maybe more of a system type guy. Um, I'm not. I'm, I wasn't there judging his throws or his talent and seeing all those different types of things. But I'm just assuming that if Brad Shermer is saying you can't play for me, there's good reason. So, I mean, cause he, Jim, one he more before we let you go, and i got to get your thoughts on your Boilermakers. Finished 7-6 and six last yes, year in Jeff Brown's first season. Lost a tough one last weekend to Northwestern. What are your expectations for your uh, Purdue Boilermakers this season? Well, that Northwestern game, well, I liked that. They, they were just giving it away in the first half, but they did a mighty job coming back. Uh, I really like uh, that, that young receiver. I, I think they're looking at, a similar type record. That's what we're looking for. I, I thought projected before the season. I, I knew they were going to be underdogs with Northwestern. I thought they could get eight, eight wins, and I'm still going to hang with that. So, Jim, we uh, we 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 got our fantasy football draft, like we talked about a minute ago. We got that underway. Or that's over with now. We're ready for first game of the season. You went Gurley, like we talked about. You went Tyreek Hill in the second round. You went Tom Brady in the third round. Overall mm-hmm. thoughts, as, as always, your team got the highest grade in Yahoo Sports for uh, for the for following the draft. Got an A minus, so you're always the top guy with an A or an A minus. Feel strong about your team? You happy? I do. And you, and you didn't even talk about my backup running back, who I picked up Penny and Chubb too, because I really think there's some upside with those guys once they, once the season gets going on. Like the Indianapolis 500 discussion, let's wait till you know what. 
you know, 100, because I think those guys will be turning it on. Hey, what was your good Thursday, Greg, by the way? Chris? I got a C. A little disappointed in the C, but, you know, they they knocked me because I took Edelman, and then I feel like, you know, Edelman's a guy I'm going to stash on my bench that will pay dividends week 5 through, you know, 16. So, and then they get, they they knock me for Will Fuller with the Texans because he's he's a little nicked up, but he'll be fine coming into you know weeks four and five. So, I got knocked for that, but I, I feel confident about my team. Anytime you know, like speaking of Boilermakers, anytime Drew Brees is your quarterback, you got to feel pretty good about yourself. I like that pick. I really do like that pick, and he's he, he's going to go and then bring a Lamar there to back him up. I just think that's beautiful all the way around. No matter you know, I don't know how many more years Drew's going to play. Him and Tom Brady both, but they're 40 plus years old, playing ball. You know, I, I'm going to go drink the water they're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Let our listeners so, know how can they stay up to date with all the things you're doing, follow you online and on social media. Ah, uh, come over. Follow me on Twitter. That's where I'm usually at. And like I say, at uh, Jim underscore Everett. Uh, most of the stuff, you know, we talk current events, we talk uh, all NFL sports. I say humorous most of the time, and out of line the rest of the time. So, anyway, follow me. I'm over at the, <laughs> over at the NFL. Love that. I'm helping them out on the boards. We're trying to get the program. I know we know the CBA is coming up. We know the union. We know the, the NFL. We're going to be in between, and we got a bunch of stuff that we're that we're doing to help uh, retired guys, current guys, make sure that. Uh, that uh, everything's going to be, you know, copacetic and, and move forward because it's, it's a good game. Um, I don't know if you agree on all the rule changes this and that, but we got to do something to make sure that our youth football is protected too. Indeed. And then I tell you what, this is always it, one of my favorite shows to be on 20 times. I can't wait to do 20 more, you guys. This is always great. Look forward to things. Have a great season and the Rams have a great season. And, uh, It'll it'll be fun. I mean, a lot of people talk about LA LA Super Bowl, and I don't know about Chargers fans out there. And I know they're far and few and far between places out of San Diego, but that would be kind of cool. Well, yeah, it would be an interesting thing. I don't think there's much of a chance in it, but uh, it certainly would be interesting to have an all LA uh, all LA Super Bowl. You yeah, can't thank you enough for all your Wait time for you. and uh, for being a guest twenty times, brother. It's always uh, a privilege for us to get to spend some time with you. All right. Hey, Bob, don't put up with Chris too much. Just call him out because that speed I, rate is actually quite high. <laughs> I'm going to try my best, Jim. It's tough. All right. <laughs> okay, buddy. Suck it. See you, Jim. Take care. That is uh, former Rams Pro Bowl quarterback, Jim Everett. Bob, you know, when you when you look back at, at all the things that Jim has done, and you Hall of Fame, he's in the Purdue Hall of Fame, he's in the Peach Bowl Hall of Fame, he's in our Hall of Fame. And uh, pretty soon, I, I got to imagine you're going to see his name and number up there in the in, when the Rams get their new stadium all put together. That he's got to be right there with uh, with guys in their Hall of Fame as well. What a great player he was! Yeah, it was it's such a great time speaking with him. And you know, we go back 20 times. I mean, he's on speed dial on his phone with us. So, uh, but he, <laughs> you know, when you think about it, I mean, I I, I just had such great memories. My father loved him. Because my father was one of these guys, he loved guys in the 80s and 90s that just threw the ball and put it in the air. And, and Everett was good for 500 passes every year and the whole flip of Anderson and Ram days and great memories. And then, of course, to now to do shows with him and pick his brain and uh, a guy and get to know him as a true scholar, too. He's not just a funny guy. He's a very smart man. It's, uh, it's an honor. And uh, there's a reason why he's a Hall of Famer, right, Chris? That's exactly right. 